Good morning and welcome to our Spruce Lake uh, online service. Thank you for, for joining us uh, this time together and we just pray and hope that you guys will be able to find this to be a worshipful time, a time that you enjoy good teaching um, and that we can, can be together even, even through a screen. So uh, please en enjoy these songs, sing along if you wish um, and enjoy our time together in this worship service. Thank you.
uncertain and scary times that we can declare it is well with my soul, Lord. We thank you for your goodness, Lord. We pray for Randy as he delivers this message that you will just empower him to be able to have the words to say um, for um, about people that are, are scared and uncertain, of people that are looking for answers, of people that we desire to look to you, Father. So we pray that you will just bless the words that he has to share uh, and, and just bless this time that we have together, even, even with uh, separation between us um, through, through a screen. We thank you for this time that we have together. I pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Greetings, church family. This is certainly a different way to do a message, and um, when I came over here to work on this, I didn't realize I had a sweatshirt on, a hoodie actually, so you'll have to forgive me for the way I look today. This is what you're going to get, and I hope this works. So I have uh, prepared just a, a message, a little bit of encouragement about God's love for us during this difficult time, because if there's anything we need to know right now, it is that God loves us. So um, let's have a word of prayer, and uh, we'll dig into the word today. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to share with the church family, even though they're not here. I pray, Father, that you would use this message for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I have very fond memories of my grandmothers, um, but I think, I'm thinking today particularly of my mother's mother, and uh, she was one of those grandmas who was blind to everyone's fault. It, it didn't matter if you had just gotten out of San Quentin. As soon as you walked through the door, she'd be up there giving you a big smooch. And she accepted you uh, just as you were. And everybody knew it, which is probably why everybody showed up every time we had a family dinner. And since some of the members of uh, my mother's side of the family were a little bit off kilter, the house, which wasn't that big to begin with, was kind of a, a crazy place. Grandma loved it, and I loved her fried chicken and her homemade macaroni and cheese. It was always the best. But there was a price to pay when you went to Grandma's house. You'd hear somebody say, uh-oh, Grandma's getting out the camera, and everybody would run for cover. Because once Grandma started taking pictures, it went on forever. She would have different combinations of family members stand together. It doesn't matter now either. If we'd just gotten together four weeks ago, Every four weeks, it was the same thing. And she was one of those ladies who had to take 10 or 15 pictures, usually a full roll, which wasn't that many because the kind of camera she used was a Polaroid. Now, if you're not familiar with a Polaroid, that's one of those instant cameras where you take the picture and the picture runs out the front and then you pull it out and you look at it and in uh, three or four minutes, you begin to see a picture. Well, she'd make a stand there while the picture would develop and we, to see if whether or not the picture turned out. And if it didn't, she'd take yet another one, which means that this went on forever. But, you know, it was always nice to see your picture on Grandma's refrigerator door. You knew that you were loved. Beyond that, it was nice to know that somehow she got all these pictures shoved into her billfold, her wallet, her purse, so that wherever she went, she could pull out pictures of her grandkids and her, and her children. Now, some of you, like me, are grandmothers or grandfathers, and how many pictures do you have? Well, today it's a little easier, right? You've got the phone, and you pull out your phone, and you show 3,000 pictures of, that you've taken because it doesn't cost anything to, to take as many as you want. But, you know, it's still, it's nice to know that you're loved and that you're cared about. And you know what? God says about that same thing about God when it concerns us. Listen as I read Romans 8. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, or any created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, you picked up right on what these verses are trying to get through our heads. Nothing. And if you look up the word nothing in the Greek dictionary, it means nothing. Nothing. 
can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Now, what if this were true? Do you know what that means? Basically, using my illustration at the beginning, God carries your picture in his wallet. Now, maybe you're thinking, oh, you're nuts. I mean, if there is a God, why would he care that much about me to carry my picture around? And why would he want to include my picture with his loved ones? Doesn't he have better things to do than to think about me? I mean, doesn't the universe need tending to? And why would I after I know what I've done? That means God knows what I've done. In fact, he even knows what I don't know that I've done wrong. Why would he count me among his loved ones? You know, that line of thinking seems to make sense. But whether it makes sense or not, if that's what's in your head, it is not lining up with God's truth. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 29, Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? In Jesus' day, sparrows were as common as they are today. They were everywhere. And just like we eat chicken wings, they ate roasted sparrows. And if you wanted a quick snack, they were about the same price as a wing today. Uh, in fact, Jesus said they were worth a cent, which was an Assyrian, a copper coin worth approximately today what uh, would be about 50 cents. So what is Jesus telling us here about these two-bit birds? He says, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. This most insignificant, this most common of birds can't even light on the ground without the creator of the universe knowing it. Now, if we're thinking hey, God's got his hands too full to pay attention to me, that line of thinking really doesn't stand up against the truth of God's word. For apparently, he's not even too busy to pay attention to an insignificant bird as it hops on the ground, which is Jesus' point. He goes on, But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So do not fear, you are more valuable than many, literally a great many, sparrows. Did you know that your head, the average head, has approximately 100,000 hair follicles? Now, some of us have a few less than that. But God knows exactly how many follicles are in each of our heads, which means he may be spending more time with some of us than others. But uh, you get the point. God is paying close attention to each and every person on this planet. Now, what if this were really true? What if the Bible's claims were really reality? What would that mean to you and to me? That maybe God, the creator of the universe, has my picture in his wallet? Maybe you're thinking, wait a minute. Let's suppose what Jesus says is true. Well, maybe it's true for you, but for me, hey, you don't know me. How many of you remember the Apostle Paul before he was saved, before he was born again? Paul was a Pharisee, and he was a religious zealot. He did his very best as this religious zealot to keep Christianity from getting started. He did this by chasing Christians down, arresting them, throwing them in prison. And any time he found Christians teaching, he would incite, incite a mob. And then mob rule would take over, and he would recommend, kind of in the background, that they be stoned. And Paul, when that would happen, would be helpful he would hold people's coats while they threw stones at whatever Christian. You remember, that's what they did to Stephen. Now, why did he hold their coats? Because it was easier for them to throw stones if they didn't have a loose garment hanging around them. And plus, since he was a Pharisee, he could have no part in the stoning himself. That would violate the law. Really a nice guy, huh? But you know what? God decided that he wanted Paul's picture in his wallet. So he reached down and he saved him from his murderous ways, after which Paul ended up writing most of what we know as the New Testament under God's direction. You know, that, this, this just doesn't make any sense from any standard of thinking that we employ. You don't make a, a hateful murderer and a primary spokesman against you the number one spokesman for you. But God did. And some years later, Paul, under God's leading, explains God's thinking in a letter that he wrote to a young pastor named Titus. He writes this in Titus chapter 3. At one time, 
we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness of the love of our God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we have done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, and He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. Man, this is just really too amazing for us to gloss over. Let's look again, back to the verse 3. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Now, I don't know about you, but unfortunately, that is pretty much a description of my heart, especially before I knew Christ. And if you came to know Christ later as I did, you could probably say that's pretty much a description of me as well. But any, regardless if you got saved later or early, we all have problems with those very nasty feelings and thoughts in our hearts and in our minds. And, and, and Paul doesn't mean that we were all, those thing, all of those things at once. I mean, we all clean up pretty well, right? And we don't always act hatefully or jealously or with envy or with malice. But sometimes it does happen. That is inside of it. Inside of us. It's, it's just there. And why would God love that? You know, I was reading a commentary, um, an article actually on advertising, about television advertising. And uh, I found this. Television does not exist to entertain us. It exists to sell us. Dr. John Condry, professor of human development and family studies at Cornell University, writes, the task of those who program television is to capture the public's attention and to hold it long enough to advertise a product. Why do broadcasters continue to offer alcohol-related, sexual, and violent programming? Well, given the overwhelming data testifying to the damage that is done to us by that fair, they don't care. Doug Herzog, while serving as president of Fox Entertainment, justified the level of sex and violence on his network, saying, this all is all happening because society is evolving and changing but the bottom line is people are buying into it and they buy the product. In other words, we like our passions and our lust to be stirred. We like to envy and desire. No wonder the, th the thought of God having our picture in, our, in his wallet is, is so absurd. Paul goes on, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. God chooses to love us, not because we deserve it, not because we've earned it. In fact, most of us realize all we have earned from our selfishness and lustfulness is trouble, trouble from God, not his love. Understand, God chooses to love us out of his mercy and his grace. Now, it would be real easy to pass over and miss the great truth that, that God is communicating to us in these passages. You ever said to somebody, oh, come on, uh, cut me some slack. And, and I think that's how we often think of God's mercy, like he's just cutting us some slack. Well, you know, I, I screwed up and I said something I shouldn't have said and um, I was grumpy, I had a bad day, so can you just cut me some slack? That doesn't really communicate God's mercy at all. Maybe a better picture is if you imagine a murderer standing before a judge and he cries out to the judge, Judge, have mercy on me. That's the meaning of mercy. It implies compassion that forbears punishing even when justice deserves it. It is standing in front of a judge when you know you deserve punishment and he decides to forego that punishment and he lets you off. Look at this verse again, verse 4 now, Titus chapter 3. But when the kindness and the love of our God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. Wow. Out of kindness, out of love, out of mercy, God sent a Savior, His Son, Jesus, to save us from this mess that we are. 
to offer us mercy, to remove every obstacle that might keep us from him. Look at the verse 5. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. All those sins, all those things that other people don't see but you know, that you believe will keep you from God, God is telling us he has offered us a solution. The punishment, the exclusion, the guilt, God has offered us a way out. Remember what Paul the murderer writes to Timothy? Yet for this reason I, I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience and his as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Paul is saying, listen, if God can choose to love me, make me part of his family, a persecutor of Christians, a murderer, then what's keeping you from receiving God's love and being accepted into his family? The Bible is clear. God demonstrates his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't die for us when we were halfway good or partway good or better than we usually are. He died for us when we're the stinking worst we are. That is incredible. God bases his love for you on your accepting Jesus as his son, not on anything you can do. John 16, For the Father himself loves you because you have loved him and have believed that I came forth from the Father. So believe on Jesus and know that your picture is then in God's wallet. You know, in times like this when fear is running rampant, when none of us know what the next day holds, in fact, every time we turn on the news, it gets more frightening, when a strange virus threatens our very way of life, as well as possibly even our own lives, if there's one thing we need to know today and tomorrow is that God loves us personally, individually. He loves you. He cares for you. He knows your name. He has numbered the hairs on your head. And he is the one who cares for us no matter what this fallen, sin-cursed world might throw at us. So today and every day, know that even, even though this world may fear, our today and tomorrow, even our eternity, is secure in the God who loved us enough to send his son to die for us. That makes me say, praise God. And my fellow believers, in this difficult day, it is really hard not to get discouraged. And I have found, even after just a few days of being much more isolated, it's very difficult. You uh, long for the ability to move around like you want, to go where you want, to talk to who you want, to be near to who you want. But, you know, for the sake of... Uh, Doing what our governor, our government has said will help, uh, we need to do what we need to do here. But you know, we are never, ever six feet away from our God. There's no social distancing with God. He's right there. He's waiting for you just to call upon Him. So don't hesitate to call upon Him. And know that you are so dear to Him that He has your picture in His wallet. Maybe on His refrigerator door. But God is there. He's there for you. And if you trusted Christ, he dwells in your heart. If you haven't trusted Jesus as Savior, know that your sins, those things that you have done that you know are not right, can all be forgiven if you accept Jesus' plan for your life. That is for you to believe that Jesus died for your sins, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day to offer you new life and love that cannot be removed from you and an eternity that is sure. Well, my people, I miss you very much, and I hope this ends soon. But as long as this goes on, I'll do my best to get a message on here for you, and hopefully I'll be not dressed in a hoodie, and maybe I'll get used to talking to a camera instead of people. Right now, it's not very easy. But let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for your people. I thank you for the congregation of Pocono Lake Bible Church. I thank you for their compassion for one another and for their prayers for one another. And Father, may those things be going up to you daily, all day long, every day. 
And Father, I pray for these people. I pray, Lord, you would draw them near to yourself, that they would feel your love, that they would feel your presence there with them. Comfort them when they get lonely and discouraged. Be that light that shines in the dark world. And Father, help us not fear no matter what happens, for we have a God who has taken care of even our eternity, which will be perfect. No tears, no sickness, no illness. Thank you, Father, for your love that you've given to us, your mercy that you've shown to us in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the love that we cannot be separated from. And I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Uh, I pray for you. I love you all. Uh, you can find me anytime you want. I'm just a phone call away. Thanks. Bye-bye.